The greatest of all time. That's the series that we're in right now. It's going to culminate on Easter morning. And today we're talking about the greatest sacrifice. Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace. And I pray, Holy Spirit, over the next few moments that you will speak life to every individual here, that you will help us, God, to hear from you today. You've got a word for every person here. And I pray, God, that every person here and those that are listening through a media outlet right now will hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. The greatest of all time. What do you think of when you think of the word the greatest? What comes to mind? Maybe it's a famous athlete, a championship. Maybe it's your favorite musician playing your favorite hit song. Maybe it's an image of a loved one, a family member, somebody that nobody else knows but you. They were the greatest. The greatest mom, the greatest dad, the greatest grandparent, which I am a part of, the greatest friend, whatever, but they're the greatest. You know, no matter what the idea or image comes to mind, there's one essential component, there's one trait that everyone that is the greatest in some area or, or seems to, to have accomplished something great, there's a trait that every one of them have in common, and that trait is sacrifice. Say the word with me, sacrifice. You know, from athletes to authors, icons to soccer moms, all have experienced sacrifice. I read where Olympic gold medalist Michael Phelps, whom you saw in the video just a moment ago, said in an interview that he practices every single day in the pool three to six hours every single day. Somebody's mowing his yard for him, aren't they? <laughs> a 2008 article in Forbes says that it's common for Olympic athletes to spend four to eight years training to make the Olympic team. They plan out their training schedules years in advance so that they can work towards and hit specific goals. One of the greatest centers in the NBA of all time, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, once said, I think that the good and the great are only separated by the willingness to sacrifice. That the only difference between the good and the great is the willingness to sacrifice. See, sacrifice is essential for success. Say that with me. Sacrifice is essential for success. A world without sacrifice would be a world without the inventions of Thomas Edison, including the light bulb and the other 1,092 patents that you and I enjoy in some way in our lives. It would be a world without the six-time NBA champion, Michael Jordan, perhaps the greatest NBA player of all time. It would be a world without Dr. Martin Luther King, whose sacrifice impacted our world, who once said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. Without sacrifice, we would have a world without freedom. Since 1775, there have been approximately 1,354,664 men and women that have given their lives in military action to secure or maintain our freedom. Almost half of that number was during the Civil War between the states where over 655,000 men and women died for the cause. It was a horrible time. Without sacrifice, we wouldn't have the Bible the great sacrifice of the apostles and so many other church leaders throughout history that have given us the ability to read the greatest book of all time. And all of these individuals sacrificed their money, their time, their talent, and their abilities, their lives, in essence. Someone once said, nothing great was ever accomplished without making sacrifices. Now, every one of you have what you have today because you've made some sacrifice to have what you have. And if you want something more than what you have, you'll have to do something and sacrifice something more than what you've done. Someone once said, if you want something you've never had, you've got to do something you've never done. And this is a good time for a personal example, I think. Last week, Rose and I were privileged to speak at the church in Kentucky that we launched. We, on February the 19th, 1984, we had our first service in this little storefront, 19 feet wide and 54 feet deep. And we, uh, we started then, and there's a call of God to plant this church in this county. 
A few days ago, the pastor called me, had some medical issues, said, could you send someone over to fill in for me? And Rose and I said, why don't we just go? And so we did. But it brings back a memory of the, of the planting of that church and when it started. You see, we, we didn't know anything about planting a church. We'd never been on staff at a church other than to serve as volunteers. We were the youth leaders for 10 years at our local church, but it was from a volunteer basis only. We'd never sat through a staff meeting. We'd never had anybody sit down, here's how you plan out a sermon. The first week, the first time I preached three times in one week was the first week I was a pastor. The first time I preached twice on a Sunday was the first Sunday that I was a pastor and also taught Sunday school and led the worship, same time. But we didn't have any money. We didn't know that you could get churches to sponsor you and to help. We didn't know. We'd have anybody to tell us or help us. And so we figured we just have to do it. And so that first Sunday morning, I, I, went, I worked in the underground coal mines and uh, I worked on a, a shift during the day, but in order to be there for every Wednesday night and, and uh, because the, sh the shift rotated and some months I was on night shift, I, I went to what was called third shift. I worked from midnight to eight in the morning. So that first Sunday morning, February the 18th, 1984, we got up around six o'clock and got our little bitty girls together, Rose did, and got them ready. We had breakfast and got up and we drove the almost 40 miles because we didn't live in that, that county at that time when we drove there. And, and uh, I played the piano and helped lead worship. And Rose taught Sunday school and I taught Sunday school and we preached and we went to eat and went home and rested a little bit and then came back, did the same thing over that night and brought our girls back and had church that night, did the same thing, went back home. I changed my clothes and then drove back to the coal mines that was in that area five miles from where the church was located in the little town there and went into coal mines that night at midnight and worked from midnight to eight in the morning. I did that for two and a half years. Never took a dime from the church. Didn't take any salary during that time because we, we just figured that's what you do. You, you, you give, you, 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 you sacrifice because we didn't have any money. The church didn't have any money. We, and we, we were paying rent and doing, we just... That, that's not what you do. I'm making, a, I'm making money to job. And so for two and a half years, that's what we did. It grew to be the largest church attendance-wise in the county during that time. I have preachers and sometimes people look at me today and say, well, it must be easy. You're pastoring a big church and, and it's all, you know, you, you got it made in the shade. I say, you, you, don't, you don't have any idea about sacrifice. Sometimes I have staff come to me, wanting, well, we need extra time off for this and extra time off for that. And I, want to, I say, okay, I understand that. We'll give that to you. But what I want to say is why don't you work 48 hours in underground coal mines from midnight to 8 in the morning and preach three times that week and teach Sunday school and play the piano and lead the worship for two years. Why don't you do that for a while and then come tell me about you need another hour off? Now, understand, I'm not being critical because I know we live in a different age and time today. I, I realize that. I, 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 I realize that. But sacrifice is timeless. Sacrifice is timeless. And Rose and I still live by that. We still live by sacrifice. We still sacrifice things. But what is sacrifice? Sacrifice is really giving up something you have to get something that's worth more than what you have. Now, I could talk about that story more and more and more, but, but I think you get the point today. A world without sacrifice is a world with great loss. See, you and I get to reap the benefits of the greats today because of their sacrifice. We have freedom today because somebody sacrificed. We, we have life today because somebody sacrificed. We have good paying jobs today because somebody sacrificed. We have, we have, a, we have road systems because somebody sacrificed. We, we have what we have today because somebody made a decision to sacrifice in the church. This church, last year, we celebrated 100 years. We had our 100-year celebration on March the 15th. 100 years because, and we had a lobby display and we were going to have it out there for three months. And guess what happened on Monday after that Sunday? The governor shut everything down. But the time, by the time we came back, we just had everything packed up and we had one day to celebrate. We were going to celebrate it all year long. 
But we were here for a hundred years. We're here today because people have sacrificed, sacrificed. I did, a, I did a funeral this past week of a beautiful lady in our church who this has been pretty much since she, she was grown, the only church she's ever been in. She's worked, she's served in a dozen different departments and areas of life. And this past week she went home to be with the Lord unexpectedly, 60, 60 some years old, precious lady. And I think of the people that have been touched and what's here because of people like that, with their sacrifice combined with this sacrifice and this sacrifice and this sacrifice, it just mounts up and mounts up. And that's what changes the world. See, who's made the greatest sacrifice of all time? It's certainly not an athlete. It's certainly not an author. It's certainly not a preacher. You see, sacrifice is defined by Scripture. Great love produces great sacrifice. I don't think that the greatest definition of sacrifice is found in the dictionary. I think it's found in the Bible, John 15, 13. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for what? For his friends. You see, great love produces great sacrifice. Great love. And quite frankly, if you've got great love, it's not really a sacrifice. Not in the sense that we think it is. Because we think of sacrifices, oh, Jesus, I'm giving up something. Oh, oh, I've got to, but it's going to be worth it all one of these days. Now, sometimes we have sacrifice like that, but true sacrifice is not that. It's I have the opportunity to let go of this so I can have this. I don't, I didn't, when, when, when we were doing that, I didn't, oh, I, I grumbled some, but, but when I worked in the mines there and, you know, you know, I, I, I didn't, when I, I got on that cage and went down in that shaft 484 feet and then got on another little thing and, and went in about four or five miles back underground and, and worked all night long. And I just preached two services and prayed for people. People had gotten saved and prayed and I'd played the piano, I'd done all these things and, 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 and I was, and I had my suit on, I looked good and my cuff links and everything. And now I've got bib overalls on and a shirt and a hard hat on and steel toed boots and I'm just as dark as it is on the inside because of the coal dust and everything and, I, and, I, and I'm doing those things. I, 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 didn't, I didn't do that because I was trying to, to earn something from God. I was doing it because God had given me the great opportunity to handle his word and love his people and I didn't know how long that was going on and I said, God, if I have to do this till the day I die, I'll do it with the joy of the Lord because you're allowing me, Lord, to hold up your word and present it. And today people got saved. People came into the kingdom because of you today. And you allow me to do this. What greater joy is this? See, great love produces great sacrifice. Athletes sacrifice for the love of the game. Activists sacrifice for the love of a cause. Parents sacrifice for the love of a family. What are you sacrificing for? I think one of the greatest reasons for divorce and separation or even bad marriages, unhappy marriages, is selfishness and unwillingness to sacrifice my will. The wife says to the husband, you can, I need you to help me to do this. He says, I need to finish this video game. Uh, let me step off of that stump because I could really, I could really talk about that. You're a grown man now, boy. Get up and act like it, okay? Come on. Video games for kids. That's, that's not in my notes, so that's free today. That's, that's just free. And vice versa, vice versa. You see, if you're going you're gonna to make a marriage work, if you're going you're gonna to have children, get ready to sacrifice. Oh, we're going to have a baby. Oh, you're going to have a sacrifice. That's what you're going to have. Yeah, you, you're going to sacrifice for the rest of your life. I had a, I, I, I had, I had a, I had a pastor, your friend, that called me this past week about having, having trouble with their grown child. And I said, you know, most, most people think that when kids get out, of, you know, they get out of school and get out of college, whatever, and away from home, you're done. I said, oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's when the real trouble starts. <laughs> and the reason is you can't discipline them and put them in their room. You can't make them do anymore. You're not in control anymore. Some of you not anyway, but you can't be in control anymore. I got to get back to my message today. 
Yeah, yeah, you, you want to have, have a great family? You got to have sacrifice, but you do it out of love. It's out of love. It's out of love. That's got to be your motivation. Jesus sacrificed for you and me because he loves. See, the greatest love comes through the greatest sacrifice. The picture of the greatest sacrifice is revealed by Jesus as he gave his life for us. You know, when you look up the word sacrifice in the dictionary, it's interesting. It's, it shows it as a verb and a noun. I didn't, I didn't think I, I liked English much when I was in school, but it's one of the subjects that I've gained so much from. A noun is a person, place, or a thing. And I think you could have by the word sacrifice in the dictionary a picture of Jesus. He's the epitome of sacrifice. Because sacrifice has a name. The name is Jesus. He is the embodiment of sacrifice, literally. He became the sacrifice for our sins through the death of his physical body. 1 John 2, 2 says, For he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. Not only our sins, but the sins of of all the world. He himself did that. Isaiah 53, 5 says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of, of for our peace is upon him and by his stripes we are healed. See, these things happen to his physical body, and it gets better. Jesus' sacrifice was so great that, that it's not just redemptive, it's preemptive. I will say that again. His sacrifice not only was, was, was redemptive, it's preemptive. It was actually the solution of sin before sin was a problem. Now, I want you to get this, Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Look at that. Before the foundations of the world. God's plan is so explicit don't ever wake up of a morning wondering if God knows what's going on. Because before the foundations of the world were laid, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of sons of Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. He made a way. He made a way for us to know him before the foundation of the world. He looked down the timeline of eternity, knowing the mistakes and things and decisions you and I would make, knowing we'd deny him sometime. He knew Peter would deny him when he chose him. He, he, knew, he knew Judas was going to betray him. He, he knew Thomas was going to doubt him. He knew others were going to leave him. He knew all of those things, and yet he chose them. He knew everything about you and I. You, you, think, you think you're going to surprise God? You're not going to surprise God. And be, but even because of that, Jesus sacrificed because he loves you. John 12, 24 says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. That's what he did on the cross. He was the first fruits of all righteousness. He gave his life so you and I could have life. Jesus is referring to himself there. He is essentially saying, my self-sacrifice produces more of myself. See, we're obviously not Jesus, yet we are called to represent or represent him to the earth. What a deal. He died for us so we can live for him. That's the key. Jesus sacrificed for us so that we could live for him. Sacrifice has a place. It's called Calvary. Have you ever heard the old saying, is this a hill worth dying for? Or is this a hill worth dying on? There's some people think every hill is worth dying on. They want to fight every battle. Every day they're looking for a hill to have a battle. Don't do that. I shared this in a Facebook post not too long ago. One of the ways you can have peace of mind is to stay off of other people's hills. And quit creating hills. Yeah, there's some to die on, and Calvary was one of those. Calvary was a hill for Jesus to die on. It was worth dying on because it was there that he gave his life for you and I. He sacrificed. John 19, 17 through 18 says, And he, bearing his cross, went out to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now, Calvary is the place where sinners are saved. 
It's the place where Jesus' redemption was purchased. The lowly are lifted, the proud are humbled, the old are made new, the place where the down and out are lifted up and taken in. It's a place of great exchange. See, my healing, your healing, from, it came from his pain. In this place where, where you and I receive new life through his name. It's new life. We, we have new life in him. Everybody shout new life. new life. It's not old life, it's new life. See, he gives us new life. His promises are new every morning. Everything from God is new. What does that mean? It's fresh. See, because of Calvary, there's a great sacrifice. But his sacrifice was on something called a cross. Now, some people look at the cross and it's just a thing. It has no significance or meaning. But actually, that, that's not anything new. It's been happening ever since Jesus died on the cross. But actually, there is something about the cross. You see, remember, there were two thieves. If you haven't read the Bible, there were three people crucified that day, Jesus and then two thieves on either side of him. And Luke 23, 39 says, one of the criminals were who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. To one thief, Jesus' cross was no different than his own. It was just the thing that they hung criminals on. But to the other thief, it was something more. You see, after hours of watching Jesus' bloodied, unrecognizable body hang on the cross, something happens. Something shifts in his heart and in mind. And in Luke 23, 40 through 43, we read his words. But the other, the other thief, answering rebuked the other thief, the one who blasphemed Jesus, and said, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we, we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Now, that's a revelation right there. See, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. But the crowd says crucify him because they were worked up by the Pharisees, the politicians of that day. And he, he, he looked at him and he says, he's done no wrong. So that's a revelation. And then verse 2, 30, 42, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, I maintain that's the greatest faith statement in the Bible. I mean, this guy's about dead. Jesus is in worship. Jesus is not standing there in his glory. He's hanging naked on a cross with his head twice the size of normal because of the thorns of crown of thorns. His body's been beaten. His ribs, you can see the rib cage. Josephus, the historian, says. His blood all over his body. He's unrecognizable. And this man says, remember me when you come into your kingdom? I believe it's the greatest faith statement in the Bible. And Jesus said in verse 43, I say to you today, everybody say today, today. you'll be with me in paradise today. See, the other thief recognized that his cross, his own cross was his due penalty to his actions, but the cross of Jesus was the sacrifice for his sins. See, the thief recognized that no one but Jesus could pay the due penalty for his sins. The same is true for us today. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. See, we, we, can, we can sacrifice to reach our physical goals in life, and we have to do that, but we can never sacrifice enough to reach our spiritual goals. And I know there are religions out there that would teach if you'll do this and do this and do this and do this and do this many prayers and, and do this many witness to this many people and do this, that, that you'll make it to heaven. But that's not in the Bible. You and I, that, that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sowed fig leaves over themselves when they sinned. It was man's first attempt at redemption. It was man's first man-made religion. Fig leaf religion. That was it. You can never earn it yourself. It only comes through the sacrifice of Jesus. And it always bugs me. Why did they pick fig leaves? They're only like that big. I mean, that's a lot of sewing. Pick elephant ears or something. I mean, I mean, really. I don't know how you read the Bible, but my practical mind looks like, really? Man, that's going to take a while. Only through the greatest sacrifice of all time can we have forgiveness of sins? Can we reach our spiritual goals? 
Well, I'm, if I pray, if I pray an hour a day, if I, if I just pray, yeah, it's great to pray an hour a day, but you're not earning your spiritual worth with God by praying an hour a day. You're developing your intimacy with God, but you're not earning spiritual uh, uh, points with God. Well, if I don't miss church, you know, we when years when we, when we grew up, we got these pins. If you didn't miss Sunday school, anybody ever antiques remember those? Yeah. And uh, I was going through a box the other day. I found one. I had, you get this spin, then you get it for a year, and two years you get something, and then they hang down through there like that, and you, you never miss. Well, that's wonderful. That's faithful. That's good. But you don't earn your spiritual relationship with God through doing things. We do things because we love him. We do things because we Jesus said, if you love me, obey my word. We do it out of relationship with him. And when we have a relationship with Jesus, that's what motivates us to sacrifice. Because when you, when you say, it's, it's, a, it's such a sacrifice to come to church. On Sunday, it's such a sacrifice to come to church. You need to get a real relationship with Jesus. Or get a better church. One of the two, I don't know, but I'm telling you. It's an opportunity to come together with the family of God where he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because we draw off of each other when we come. Faith intensifies. If one could put 1,000 to flight, two could put 10,000 to flight. I'm telling you when we get to, this is, this is a happy time every week, Sunday morning, together with the family. The faith rises in our hearts. There's joy in the place. Wow. Why would you want to miss it? And even if you're at home watching right now, you're watching, you're participating, you're connecting. See, there's, there's something about that. I don't, I don't have anything of value. I, I determined this many, 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 many years ago. I, I don't have anything that's more valuable that I need to keep instead of something Jesus has for me. Anything he asks me for, I'm going to give it to him. Why? It's his anyway. And all but the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Well, you don't know what my bank account is. You don't know what I have in stocks. You don't know what I've inherited. If you knew my net worth and my assets, get over yourself. One of these days, you're going to quit breathing. And none of it's going with you. And your kids are going to get rid of that stuff hanging on the wall. They don't care about it. <laughs> Sometimes I go through my house, I think, nah, they're going to get rid of that. Nah, they, I, maybe I'll just go ahead and sell it right now and spend the money on myself. <laughs> I think I will. That's a good, I thought that's from the Lord. I think I will. I'm going to do that. <laughs> we have nothing. that's valuable, that isn't exchangeable, something more valuable that God has. Nothing, nothing. And God keeps good score. When you think that nobody sees what you're doing and you're sacrificing and you're serving and you're not on the screen and you're not in the, in the, in the, in the headlines and, no, and nobody's giving you an award, hey, hey, God keeps good score. And I'm going to tell you his rewards are far above anything you'll set on your desk or hang on the wall. God keeps good score. And I'm so thankful today. I am so super duper blessed. I have a beautiful wife. Tomorrow will be 40 seven years of marriage. Uh, I have a healthy body, slim, trim looking. <laughs> have two beautiful daughters and son-in-laws that love God, are serving God, children that love the Lord. They, they come over and they play music with the three little ones and, and sing, my God is great, my, and they do all the, try to do all the, you know, the, my God is great, my God is great. Wow. 
blessed. I got a dog. <laughs> Hadn't had a dog in 25 years. I've got a beautiful German shepherd, loves me. You know, a guy said one time, he said, you know, your dog loves you the most. I said, no, no, your wife loves you the most. I said, no, your dog loves you. No, your wife loves you. And the guy said, put your wife and your dog in a trunk, leave them for four hours, come back, open the door, and see who's happy to see you. <laughs> Lord bless them, amen. We'll go home now. <laughs> what are you willing to sacrifice for? Maybe there's people here, the Holy Spirit's dealing with you right now. Sacrifice for your family. Maybe you haven't been. Maybe there's some dads here that, you know, the real issue is you just need to sacrifice. You want to be the king, but you never made your wife the queen. You want your kids to respect you, but you don't spend any time with them. Moms, same thing. You want a king in the house, but you've never respected him. He needs to earn it. Okay, flip that quarter over. If you want something, give something. Sow into what you want. You know, they just don't appreciate me at my work. Are you, are you sacrificing there? I just want the Lord to bless me. I just want the, oh, Jesus, bless me, bless me, bless me. What are you willing to sacrifice? Now, you can go through the Bible. I mean, you can read through it, and you can find instance after instance after instance where God required people to make sacrifices before he did something. It's like, Lord, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this. Lord, if you get me out of this spot, I'll, I'll serve you for two weeks. It's usually, I'll serve you all my life, but it winds up being two weeks. What's God speaking to you? Maybe, maybe you've got a situation in your family, not husband or wife, but extended family, and, and the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now and say, if you'll sacrifice your pride if you'll just sacrifice your pride and your ego and you'll set that aside God can position you for healing in that area maybe the Lord's dealing with you about something personal you and you have a goal but you can't seem to get there you just keep you just but it's because you get to a point to where it requires this another level of sacrifice and you're not willing to go that level. What's the Lord saying to you today? I don't know, but you need to know. What is he saying to you? Jesus made the greatest sacrifice of all time for our sins. Maybe, maybe you've never experienced his grace and his love. Maybe, maybe you've never, you're either watching right now or you're sitting here right now and we're looking eye to eye. And, and if I were to say, do you know that 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 Jesus is the Lord of your life, that your sins have been forgiven, that it, as, if you, as they used to do in church, if you breathe your last breath today, do you know you would be in heaven? That's a legitimate question. And if you don't know, you're never more than one simple sincere prayer away from sincere prayer away from the love and grace of God. I used to, I used to, I've heard people say before, I've even heard preachers say it. Salvation is free. It costs you nothing. Well, salvation is free. It costs Jesus everything. Not just, not just a sacrifice on the cross, but three years out of heaven, 33 years out of heaven. Come to earth, born as a baby, go through all of that. Oh, it cost a lot. It, it cost a lot. And salvation in itself is free to you, but it's not without cost on you either or me. You know what it costs? It costs our will. It does cost something. Well, I just pray a little prayer and it'd be all right. No, 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 no. That doesn't work that way. The Bible says, believe in your heart 
Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. That believing thing encompasses a whole lot. Because when you believe it, you do it, see. If you believe in Jesus, you follow Jesus. It's not just like punching a card and say, yeah, I got that one, now I move on. No, it's, a, it's an eternal relationship with him. It's a lifetime journey. And it's the best journey of life. I like to say it this way. You, you'll face life one or two ways, with God or without God. It's a whole lot better with God. A whole lot better. Because we're going to have tragedy with God or without God. We're going to have tough times with God or without God. We're going to be hurt with God or without God. We're going to be betrayed with God or without God. And we're going to have a lot of wonderful things happen with God or without God. But I'm telling you, life is a lot better with God. In eternity, well, enough said. <laughs> it's the only way to face eternity. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you're, you're not sure, you don't know for sure that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Your one simple, sincere prayer away from God's grace, permeating your life, changing you, transforming you forever and ever and ever. But it does require your will to say, not my will anymore, but your will from this moment forward, God. Your will from this moment forward. Would you stand to your feet all over the building right now? Would you just please for a moment here? I want to pray with you right now and I want you just to have your own little prayer time with Jesus. If something's been dry, if you're, if you're like, hey, I'm, this is a great message, but I'm cool. I mean, I'm Mr. Sacrifice. I'm Mrs. Lay down my life forever. Okay, that's wonderful. Great, fine. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking something to you or has said something, you've had that dominant thought come up in your mind while we're sitting here and it's not going away, I believe that's the Lord. If he's speaking to you about something in your life, some area of sacrifice, then talk to him about it right now. Make a commitment right now. Say, Lord, from this moment forward, this is what... Now mean it. Mean it. Don't, don't make a vow to God that you don't mean. Mean it. But if you mean it, you want that to change in your life. You, maybe you, you just, you're on the edge of a breakthrough, but that breakthrough requires one more sacrifice on your part, whatever that may be. That's between you and God. Talk to him right now as I pray with you. Father, I join together this morning with my family, not only the ones here, but the ones watching. And I pray, Holy Spirit, right now that you would open their hearts, speak life to each of us, help each of us to hear from you. Let your voice be clear out of our spirit, into our mind. Let your voice be clear right now. Give us direction. Give us guidance. Show us. Show us areas of our lives you want to work with, you want to help us with. You want to teach us, Holy Spirit sacrifice and I thank you Father now I thank you for the great exchange because when we bring our sacrifice Jesus brings his blessing and promises and now Father there may be people standing here or watching now that they're not sure they don't know for sure that they've been forgiven of their sins. They're seeking because that's why they're here today or that's why they're tuned in. And I pray, Holy Spirit, now that you would cause their faith to rise up because everybody's been given a measure of faith and cause their faith to be ignited now to reach out to you. If you're standing here in this place or you're watching right now, I want to invite you to do something. I want to invite you to pray a very simple, sincere prayer with me. If you're not right with God, but you want to be right with God, you want to know that you've been forgiven, you want to know that you're part of the family of God, you want to have that assurance on the inside, I want to lead you in that simple prayer in just a moment. And I'm not going to come back to where you are. I'm not even going to have you to come up to here where I am. I want to try to help you to get to where he is. But I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith today. What have you got to sacrifice to do it to take a step of faith today? As people are praying across this building right now, if you're watching, when I count to three in just a moment, I want you to, if that's you, 
Just simply by your actions, say, that's me, Lord. That's me, Lord. That's me. Today, I'm reaching out to you by simply raising your hand and putting it back down. Nobody's coming back to where you are. And I don't even have to see it. It's an act of faith on your part to say, Jesus, that's me. And this is my day. Are you ready? One, two, three. Do it right now. Yes, 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 yes. God bless you. The others, see that hand, the risers. Yes. And over here, anyone else? And obviously I can't see the ones online, but if you're there, just raise your hand wherever you are in your hotel room or you're in a store, you're sitting there on your iPad, whatever you are right now. Now I want you to pray this simple prayer. Yes, I see that hand. I want you to pray this simple prayer loud enough to hear yourself and family. Let's do what we get to do. The great privilege that we have every day, every week here at Cape First to lead people to Jesus. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for reaching out to me. And today, Jesus, I'm reaching back. I ask you now, come into my heart and life. Forgive me of my sins. Change my life forever. I give my life to you, Jesus. All my hopes and dreams, all of my hurts and pains, I lay them at the cross and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I boldly say with my new faith, I am forgiven, born again, saved, and I'll never, never, never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give those folks a standing ovation.